Come, nice come on in. Dean, look, look who's Julia Louis Dreyfus. Remember? This is Dean. We, we went over his house the other day. It's Julia. This is fantastic. I can't believe we're actually meeting like this is great. You were supposed to come the other day and you, you didn't show up? Okay, can I tell you something, sure. my friend? Tell me. When you make appointments, keep it. Because now I'm busy and I can't talk to you anymore. Julia. Keep your appointments. Hi everybody, uh, this is Jeff Garland and... And I'm Susie Esman. She is Susie Esman. Well, I'll tell you, it feels pretty good these days. Yeah. You know, young people all want to be Susie Esman. <laughs> all right. So, uh, we are on episode six, The Wire. The Wire. Yeah. All right. So, here's what I'm going to say. I didn't say this last recording. Last episode was when we first got our footing, episode five, for what the show became and what the show is. Explain. Well, last episode... The interior decorator. Yeah, the interior decorator. But, okay. There was a producer named Nat Hyken. This is this is in the 50s, early Nat 50s. Nat Hyken created Sergeant Bilko, Car, Car 54, 54, Where, where are, are You? I know we've lost a lot of you at this point. But the point being is, he wrote in a style where it was like dominoes. You push the dominoes, they go in a million different directions. You don't know how it's going to end. And things with the dominoes, the twists and turns... There's only one writer who writes that way. Larry David. Larry David. Who, who was influenced by, by Nat Hyken. Very Heiken. much influenced yeah. by Nat Hyken. Uh, by the way, I'm influenced by Nat Hyken, but not like Larry. That was And, and his, his influence goes way back to Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. most, most definitely. Yeah. But what I'm saying is last episode, at least up until that point, was one of those domino episodes where it goes all around. Yeah. You don't know where it's going to end. back. Now, this episode, it clicks and it never stops from here until where we're at the show now. This is the episode that started what we are. That established what, what Curb is going to be. What Curb is going to be. And what most people don't know, if you go back and you look, you go to the Museum of Broadcasting or something like that, and you go look at pilot episodes of old sitcoms. Isn't it the Museum of Media or something? Maybe, whatever. Yeah, something. yeah. But you look at pilot episodes of old, beloved sitcoms. It used and, to be the Museum of Television. And brought, it was down the block yeah, from where we are I now. I know, but they, they don't, they change the name. So, and, and you look at the pilot episodes Which and you so see. Which was so fun. Com I've done it several times. The pilot episodes are nothing like what the, the series, series ended yeah. up being. The characters are, because it takes time to find itself. Yeah, but it's, and which normally shows are not allowed that time. They're canceled before they right. do find themselves. I think the most famous one is actually Seinfeld. Seinfeld, yeah. They wanted to kill that early on. But that's the thing. Like our pilot, of this show. Of Kirk. Uh, yes, yeah. the special pilot. And the episodes to follow, we're all finding our way. And by the way, if someone says, what about uh, Amco or whatever that episode is? Yeah. That was actually our third episode. It got moved. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get to that. I'll discover more about it and maybe answer questions as to why it got and, moved. And this episode, The Wire, the Wire, was the first time that it, that we have Larry Charles directing. Yes. Uh, Larry Charles was involved in the other episodes because he was an executive no, producer he was at not. the time. He was no, not. he was not. He was oh, not. season two, he came on as an executive producer. I don't know if it was two producer. or three, but I actually, I didn't have to beg Larry, but it was my idea for sure saying, can we bring Larry, Larry Charles. Charles on? He brings so much to it. And Larry uh, Charles came from Sign felt and mad about you and several and other by the way, things. He created one of the most one of the greatest comedies of all time, Borat. Borat, yeah. No, but his mind is he's a brilliant dude. Yeah. And I love the guy. And I wish he worked on the show now. That would be so much yeah, fun. I had never met him up until the right. day that we directed. Did, did, yeah. well, we'll get to that scene. And I knew him from Mad that. About You. He was a right. producer on Mad About You, which I was on. And also at the end of the episode, I'm like, that episode was really well directed. And I saw Larry Charles, Larry name, Charles. and I smiled. Yeah. Well, I remember it was Larry Charles because yeah. that was my first real yeah. episode, which we'll get to. And by the way, Larry Charles quite often wears pajama bottoms. He does wear pajama bottoms. Like quite often, like almost always. I know, but nonetheless, <laughs> he's, he wears a, pajamas. he's a groovy dude. So we start the episode with you, Jeff, on the phone. You, you sponsored a Fresh Air Front kid, and he set fire to the canteen in the cabin at the camp. All right, so I think this is the first mistake of the show. What? Okay, because I just said how we're moving in a new direction. The way I talked on the phone to you 
was as if I'm talking to a businessman, a client. There was no emotion. Oh, by the way, I didn't even think you were talking to me. That's how much it came off. Yeah. So we I thought you were talking to the camp. We hadn't. This episode it comes, but we really haven't established how terrified Larry and I are of you. And so it, it's ironic that the episode starts because this episode is where we find out. But yeah, it was a terrible choice. Right. And it was a terrible choice to put in the show. It was just These are bad. the things we've learned on our way. No, you learn. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about shows. So even this show, there's mistakes. You figure it, but I made the first one. And, you know, you say something, yeah, you try to do something nice. And Larry says, For you to, to, to stop helping I people. got out of the nice business at that point. Well, yeah, which is like hilarious. Well, by the way, first off, he sees a woman about to be hit by a car. He doesn't pull her out of the way. He just yells out. So Me, if that's the case, although I did once try and stop a, a woman who was about to get hit by a car, I screamed out, watch out! And she said, don't you tell me what to do! You know, I tried to save her life, and she screamed at me. So <laughs> I got to tell you, that is just hilarious. That is hilarious. It the is. fact that he thought of that, he's so fucking funny. So then Cheryl and Larry want to bury an unsightly no, wire. No. Cheryl. Cheryl wants to wants bury it. Which you know was something that probably happened in real life from his Larry's first life. I would life. guess. It's, I would it guess. sounds yeah. like something. I, I don't blame her. I hate those wires. Uh, they want to bury a wire in the backyard, but not all the neighbors are on board with it. They have to get approval from the neighbors. And if you've ever had to go through this process, it is a huge pain in the ass. Right. Uh, so they have to meet the neighbors who are reluctant. And it is Dean and Phyllis. Dean played by Wayne Fetterman and Phyllis played by what is her name? Lucy Webb. Lucy Webb. Lucy Webb, uh, I knew from I don't I didn't know her personally before that. She was on a show called Not Necessarily the News. Hilarious. Which I, which I believe was on HBO. And then Wayne Fetterman. I met Wayne Fetterman in nineteen eighty four at the comic strip. Okay. I met Wayne Fetterman in nineteen eighty two <laughs> at the comic strip in Florida. In Florida. And, okay. and by the way, he grew up in, like, I'm from Chicago, but I grew up, I moved to F South Florida, and I lived in a town called Plantation. My best friend's older brother was close friends with Wayne Fetterman. Get out of here. No, no, which is so crazy. <laughs> we both grew up in the same town in Florida, you know. And, and Wayne, Wayne was a stand-up comic stand -up that we comic, came up with. Who, by the way, everybody loves. Everybody loves. I know nobody who doesn't love Wayne Fetterman. A sweetheart and, you know and who he very wrote funny. It. And by the way, you know who he worked with closely was uh, Gary Shandling. I didn't know that. Very close with Gary, yep. I didn't. And did he write for him? Or? He wrote a lot for Gary. Uh -huh. I don't know how much stand-up wise, but a lot of stuff that Gary did. Well, he's here. Yeah. He plays Dean Weinstock. Wayne and I were in an improv group together correct, at correct. the comic strip. Did you really? know that? Yes. I didn't know that. Monday nights. Was it Monday nights? Yes, it was. That so was tell Lucian's us how you got this show. part on Curb. Well, it's partly to this guy to the left. I think he recommended me as my Is understanding. Is that true, Jeff? I recommended him, and I got no argument. But here's the thing that Jeff forgets. I first auditioned for the role of the blind guy. I don't know what episode. That's that after was. this. No, it's not. I auditioned as the blind. And again, I can do a lot of things in show business. Blind. Not I, your I studied with Stella Adler. Well, I by never the way, <laughs> I know for sure I recommended you for that. <laughs> you know, there are certain people that I would recommend because of how wonderful they are, uh, not knowing they're exactly right for the role, but maybe, I don't know. And he was- uh, he, The he was guy who ended so up the playing the blind guy, I forgot his name, but he was terrific because oh, he, he came great. back he later terrific. in the yes, producer's yeah, yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, yes. he was he was truly fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then, we had to move the furniture numerous yeah. times. Yeah, so. yeah, that scene with Richard, yeah. So, and again, this is first season, so- I had only seen the show, the one with Judy Toll, the big special the, the or whatever special. it was. So this is what I, so I go in for the blind guy. I don't, I do the best I can, but I don't get it. And, and, and to tell you the truth, I, when I didn't get that, I was thinking, is this going to be the Seinfeld situation? Cause I always wanted to be on Seinfeld. And you never were. Never were. So then when the, it was like two episodes later, they brought me back as a guy who's in love with Julia who, Louis Dreyfus. Yeah. Like, by the way, this I know how to do. By the way, know how to do? You blasted it out of the park. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you thank were you. so. You were like, and they, these things don't happen often, but there are always people who will cross the line with favors, with 
you know, not knowing what fame right, really right, is. Right. Oh, my God. And you nailed that. You nailed that. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank sure. you. So that was it. So we went in and you were there that day. You weren't. But I know that episode is famous for your character. Yeah. Well, that was my first real Susie Green moment. Right. In that episode. Because that was the fat fuck moment yeah. and all yeah. of that. And it was yeah. like, people were like, what the heck? It was yeah. so well, great. Wasn't that the one with the fresh air fund? Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's an insanely good episode. The Wire was when was the first episode that it took on a, a voice. Really, it yeah. not the a, one with the bracelet before. Not the that, one. Was, no, they, no, that was a great no. episode. But, but not, this was when you really started to uh, feel ah, this, this makes is Curb. No, Curb is gelling. Yes, boy, oh boy, yes, you were part of that. Because uh, you know, you know how a show yeah, takes a while course, to course. gel and find its, its voice. It was still shot on video, if I'm not mistaken. On like, oh uh, no, no, we, this was shot at this point on whatever the most advanced digital was. But here's something else I do remember about that day. I remember the day pretty vividly. And that was, that was one day, all that stuff? Because um, it's a lot of stuff. No, it was, I think it was, I went back for the, the second scene where I come yeah. back and Julia But that was lives. 23 years ago. Yeah, I know. I remember. It's a long time. I, so I, tell yeah, us. I'm, tell us yeah, what you remember. I know you've done hundreds of these episodes. <laughs> I've done two. So I remember them pretty vividly. <laughs> tell um, us what you remember. No, well, I remember the multiple sweaters we tried on because I had to be wearing a bad sweater was part of the thing. Mm -hmm. I also remember talking to, and now I'm blanking on his name, the director, the guy with the beard. Bob Whitey. Oh, no, Larry Charles. Oh, Larry, Charles. Larry Charles. Larry Charles directed yeah, yeah. that episode. But Whitey right. was there. And also that the name Dean Weinstock was named after Lotus Weinstock, the comedian. Uh, how about that? I never knew you that. You never knew that? No. Okay, it's breaking news here yeah. on iHeartRadio. Yeah, no, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I, and I had done shows at Lotus, and obviously I'm friends with her daughter, and was, you know, so. Tell people who Lotus Weinstock is. Well, she was, she's famous for being... Lenny Bruce's last girlfriend. She's a comedian. I would say almost an alt kind of comedian. And also, in her day, very popular. Very comedian. popular comedian. Comedy store act and wore yellow. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was her thing. She liked to wear yellow on stage. Yeah. Your and, nickname was Bananas. Come over here, Bananas. <laughs> Go ahead. So she was just, you know, a comedian. Like, in fact, I think she was working. And it's, in fact, it's in my book, pre-comedy store. Obviously, she was around the 60s. Lenny Bruce dies yeah. in 66. So she was doing stand-up in L.A. So she was a pioneer. Before the comedy store, which where, opens in 72. Where did where she would play it? Well, yeah, there was a the Little Room in um, Beverly Hills. There was a place. Uh -huh. There was um, the Something Cafe. Uh -huh. Obviously, that place out on, the, on Santa Monica Pier. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so all of those little lead betters before uh, it became the comedy store, Westwood Room. By yeah. the way, I want to plug yeah. his book. Yeah, I was just going to say, what, well, what is the book you tell just me the comedy, Tell me the comedy book and then I can also mention the other Okay, book. the book is, it's called The History of Stand-Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. So we right. start around 1858 and go right till today yeah. and just tell the history of it. Right. And it's not like an interview book. Where By the you, way, you're so... Perfect to write a book like so that. Wait, Thank you. So and we, it's very short. It's 150 pages. Like, right. I really, like, blow through. So when you say that, how did you get the history? You just, your memories, you research? Well, what? I teach a class on it at USC. Oh, I didn't know that. You yeah. shut your You're grandma's a professor. balls. Yeah, I'm professor. Look at Mr. Professor Fetterman. By the way, what's Fetterman. that like? Is it the history of comedy that you history teach? History of stand-up. Different than the Can history of... Can I come of... speak at it? Of course. Of I'd course, love to. Of course. Of I course. love talking to young people I about their should. futures. And I'm no Lucian. I encourage. Lucian encouraged only certain <laughs> no, people. but I'm going to single somebody out. Who told you you're funny? It's in the front row. Everything you're saying, not funny. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Wait, continue with the book. So, that's the book. It's very short. A guy from the New York Times, Jason Zinneman, lost his mind about it. The Vulture did a thing. So, it's just a book about that. So, I've if always... you love stand-up, I recommend the book because, mostly, it includes me. Does right. it include me? Yes, yes. Both of us. Goodies. Of course. Yes, yes, yes. How could it not include you? <laughs> yes. I didn't know. Yes. No, no, but it's mainly about how it evolved from pre-vaudeville to vaudeville to nightclubs to coffee houses, which is where Carl and Borscht Belt, Borscht the, Belt yeah. Miami Beach, yeah. Vegas. And then, of course, we were part of the comedy you know, the club, comedy club yeah. starts in 63 with the improv. But in 72, the comedy store opens and... Catch a Rising Star opens the right. same year. Oh, wow. So and 72. the boom yeah. happened in the 80s where and the it just but it took is, off. Yeah, yeah. And, but and we were all very, very lucky to be part of the boom. I agree with oh you. Very God. lucky. 100%, not 97. And that was just a timing lucky thing. Lucky we just Did lucked it end in. in 97? Even though, I have to say, let me ask you this. When you were started, because we all started at the same time. Right. 
Did you feel like there were a lot of people even then doing comedy and it was hard to get in? No. No. Well, for me, I know this. And you weren't much older than me yeah, when, you started, yeah. when we met, which was in 84. Yeah. So for me personally, when I started, the only other people around my age were Eddie Murphy and two, Dana Gould, two or three other people. Uh, what's his name? Bobcat Goldthwait. Like there weren't like nowadays, I think there's at least a thousand people under the age of 25 doing stand up. Oh, you I know? see younger people. And, and so whether well, there's 100 or 10,000 comedians, there's still only going to be about 20 funny ones. Uh, I mean, it's an exaggeration. Right. But I agree. So back then. I, I felt like back then that we were a very small community. Very small. And that we knew everybody. You'd yeah. walk into a club. You knew right. every comic. You knew yeah. every. And wherever you went, whether you were at the Here's impulse. how small it was. When people appeared on TV. Comedians in the clubs would gather around the TV and be happy for him. Nobody was like, oh, screw him. Well, some, some were happy, some well, by were the not. Way, <laughs> later, maybe that was the case. But I, at the beginning, I don't remember that. And I remember being in the comic strip the night that Letterman's show first aired. That's why I'm... I, the I, night show or the morning show? The night show. The, the morning night. show but, I skipped but, but, college. But that being to said, watch, Wayne... To watch. It yes. still was always difficult to get spots, yes. and getting spots was the most important this thing is what for I'm a saying. comedian. There was a lot of comics, there was, there was even a, then. There was competition. No, there was gold. There was just a lot it, of there these There was guys. competition. Gold. Why did you pull that out of <laughs> I'm your I'm just ass? saying there was just a lot no, of guys. By the way, I have to know, when we hang out next, I have to have just keep pulling them out of your ass. But there was, Bill Keller. And, 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 and what the audience, our audience needs to understand is that spots okay. are everything. You can. The only way to be a good comic is to get a lot of stage time. Time. And Sucked. and you and you you had to compete for those spots. And I remember he was talking about the comic strip. I remember calling up. Was it Monday? We would call to get the spots for the week. And you would be so disheartened if you maybe only had one spot or no spots. And then I'd, I'd feel like that's it. My career's over. And it was it was By all way, about getting the spots. I'm going to guarantee that when people called in, there may have been forty to fifty comics. Now I dare a young comedian to get into the comedy store. It is near impossible. Is that true? And, yes. And and I'm just talking about the comedy store. I'm talking about all clubs because there's so, and road clubs too. There are so many comedians now right. that it is hard to get but a spot. But I think the point that Wayne's making is even though there were less of us, it still felt very competitive. No, extraordinarily competitive. And I felt the competition, but it didn't mean you, were, you weren't happy unless somebody was an asshole. But there weren't a lot of assholes back then. There were some. There was quite a few. I didn't. Did you know quite a few? Yeah. yeah I'm not going to name names. Me no, I don't want you to name a name. Also, for just me, it was a little was, different. But also, I'm from Florida. Like, I'm a very, like, easygoing guy. You've known me a long time. Yeah, you, you wear flip-flops on stage. But knew you... Not true. And you wear portable sad, palm tree. I wore saddle shoes. I, and you wear a Jimmy Buffett shirt. But there was, you know, like, that was new to me to be in New York in such an aggressive environment yes. where it was... Oh, also, for me, it was a little bit different. Tell because me. if you recall... They would only put one woman yeah, on the show. Yeah, that's true. That is they true. They would never By put way, more that's than. That's why you're a pioneer. Right. Well, they would never that put era, more than. So if there was, one of the you, ones. but there was number. You know, there, Patty was there, was there Patty, with you. There was Joy, and we were all supportive generally. Susie, Not all of us. Susie Sazma was there. Susie. Uh, sorrow. Sorrow. Oh, yeah. No, Susie. No, I'm talking about oh, Ronnie Susie Shakespeare. Larson. Yeah. But Susie her Larson. real name is Susie Sazma. Susie uh, Sorrow was in the Susie Pirate Sorrow. of Curb. But, but there, the but there, of Curb. But there was, lunch with there, were, there were, there were right. enough that it was competitive because they would only put one woman on a show. They Abby would put Stein. Abby Stein. Sure. Uh, who? But who's the one who did Betty Davis? What was her uh, name? Uh, Mary uh, uh, Nancy, Nancy Parker. Nancy Parker. Nancy Parker. Nancy, there was a Nancy Redman who did a character. Nancy Redman. Yeah. Sure. I, there was a but lot my, of women. But my point was, they would only put. For you. They would only yeah. put one of us on. They put male, 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 and they would only put one woman. They would never put two women back Ever. to back. Ever. Where can we find this book, Wayne? It's there's a on site Amazon? called Amazon. It's on the web. Okay. Oh, by and the way. And it's called... Amazon.com. It's is called The, the History of Stand-Up Comedy. The History of Stand-Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. To, and by uh, Wayne Fetterman. Yes. And just I'm, I'm going to get things. it. You are? Yeah, of course I am. I you're going to sign it for me. I should have brought it. I should have brought it. But by the way, also a great book on Pete Maravich. I'll leave it at that. And what was the other book you wrote? You on just, Pete Maravich. Yeah, that's a basketball player that I wrote around I know the year who he 2000. Is. Oh, you do? Of course. Oh, I'm a sports girl. You are? She is. Yeah. That's right. Oh, okay, yeah. That helps our so friendship because we've always co wrote co-wrote the authorized biography of Pete Maravich, and it was an insane 
experience for wow. me. Wow. That was that was the start of Wayne Fetterman going from I'm talking about myself now. All I wanted to do in life is stand up and act when I started. When you get, when you met me in 80, that's all I didn't want to be on a writing staff. I didn't want to didn't ever had a packet. Anything like that. <laughs> Any of those I things. I remember the packets. <laughs> What's the oh, packets? The packet is you go. Uh, uh, by the way, I delivered uh, uh, um, Louis C.K.'s packet to Conan because we had the oh, same manager, and I yes. and I and I used to be roommates with Conan. So I'm like, oh, Louis C.K. And my manager's. They said we have this packet. I'm going to deliver it right not now. Not a package. No, not a sample. A packet. A packet. A packet. A packet. A packet. And okay. everything's in there. Let's go back to Wayne Fetterman. <laughs> well, by the way, it's our show with Wayne. It's not in. Interview, it's a conversation. Yes, Tell course. me what you remember about Curb. Besides the sweaters and then talking to Bob Whitey about what we're doing, which is, I don't, I'll always remember what he said to me. He goes, it's like we start with a rock and then we're going to polish it and do it numerous times. And then by the end, we'll have what we want. And so he's again, alluding to a diamond. And I would disagree. No, he didn't use diamond. I think it was like a polyd, like a marble or something like that. But the, like, <laughs> like it was. <laughs> that exchange is so awesome. Was it diamond travertine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but the point was, like, don't worry about it. Obviously, everyone knows there's no lines in it. So that's, I, I can't say this highly, more clearly, is that that's right up my alley. That is, I don't have to worry about saying the line correctly. I don't have to worry about the timing of it. I don't have to worry about their line. And I just have way, to react in the moment, which is something Jeff and I talked about for years. Right. With his, what great improv is, is obviously yeah. listening. Right? Yeah, no, what I was going to say to you, because yeah. you were great in those Thank things you. from the get-go. Thank and you. And there's two questions. I'll start with the second question. Yeah. Did Larry break up a lot from yes. what you were doing? Yes. See, that's a thing that we try and explain that... Considering he knows Wayne and Wayne's tickling him, making him laugh, he probably, I remember him losing it. But yeah, he lost it when you would say things. Yeah. So anyway, because I can play passive aggressive. Right. It's, it's part of me. I'm Because I'm not aggressive aggressive. Right. Have you ever seen, you've known me. No. 30, ever. Like get up and someone's nothing. But I can be passive a little bit. So I knew that guy right away. I was just like, oh, this is the, the worst guy in the world under the guise of being the nicest guy right. in the world, right? That's the whole thing. Someone once said to me, "Helpful, about I'm helpful. I can do this for you. But I, I have information." Quid pro quo. Yeah, you know, he, he he was just cracking up, and he just kept saying, "Do more of that. Do more. Do a little and less." By of the that. way, when someone's kicking ass in their role, he gets so excited. Yeah. He enjoys so, it. He, gets he, does. So, he does. He's so yeah. happy because you're what he wanted. He pictured it's you his doing vision. it. It's, it's his, his vision. vision. And when it matches, because he, by the way, a lot of his laughter is thinking about how absurd what he wrote is. Right. And if that matches, the character comes out that he. But, he's but, still, but also, it, he wrote it and he's pictured it. But then somebody like Wayne comes along and brings it to another level another that he level. never but thought of. But also, I was of. with also, um, why am I blanking on her name? Who played my wife? She's uh, the, hilarious. Is, yeah. Lucy yeah, Lucy Webb. Yeah, it was Lucy, Lucy Webb. Webb. I, sorry, Lucy, because I'm just happy to be working with her, to tell you the truth. Very much so, And yeah. it was just very easy, and he kept cracking up, which And by the way, me... you gave a ton of opportunities for uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who is a delightful, wonderful human being, and you gave her so many softballs to get angry at. Yeah. I, I remember that it just was, you gave her just a, a full color palette. Here, paint your picture. Right. It was amazing to right. see. Yeah. There is also an amazing moment in that where Lucy invites Larry over for dinner at our house. And he just is so furious at us that he goes, I can't. There's something wrong with my stomach. I don't know if you remember this moment. Sure. Yeah. That made actually made me laugh because it was so... On the boiling, Balls. the yeah. boiling underneath, and him trying to be nice because we need the lawyer to take care of your thing right. yeah. and and get the wire. So right. it was the like, wire. yeah. Here's the other thing I remember in the final scene. I come back, and I found his book. 
I don't know if you notebook. remember. Oh, his his notebook. notebook. Which, his by notebook. the way, that was totally Larry and a lot of comedians. I still carry paper in my pocket of course. with a pen. But, but that was but, his actual book. That wasn't a prop. Oh, really? Yes. That, by the way, is really surprising. I, I, I know. I'm, that I'm was very surprised that he would book. actually give up his book but by when the way, he could have had a prop. He does it on his phone now. And I can't believe it. Really? But, but it's He's backed made, up. He's yeah, happy. Because yeah. I've been with him. Mm -hmm. You couldn't calm him down when he lost the book. He was so upset. He was, yeah, because he says I that's the hardest part of the really show. I can't believe that was really his book. Yes. I'm shocked that he would use his that real was, book. Yeah. So then the I little known facts that we're you. learning from Wayne Fetterman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's trust. Trust. All? Does it's it's great. Oh, my God, it's great. <laughs> so it was his original book. And this is just the neurosis of an actor. Okay, just, you know, you're always trying to please people. So... We do that scene, at make out a check, you know, just the, hey, there was a reward. You know, I do the <laughs> yeah, whole. That was great. It just yeah. says to the L. David, I put it two and two together. Yeah. This is the So, you know, all of the, obviously it's him, right? Right. <laughs> a week later, I get a call. We may have to reshoot at Curb. I was like, oh, I fucked up. I By did the terrible. Way, that's the instantaneous reaction. So, I don't know so if you've ever had. Have yeah, I was like, what did I do? I thought I nailed it. I right. thought a thing. This was okay. And then later on, they were like, nah, we're going to keep it. And then I realized why. Because in one of the shots, the window shade is closed once and then it's oh, open it for another. It thing. was a continuity yeah. thing. And I saw that they had to edit around it. And I was like, <laughs> Wayne, I just think it's so interesting that yeah. immediately you immediately went to, which we all do, I fucked up. Well, well when I got way, the call, every one of I us know, does that. I know. Do you have that too? Of oh course my God, we all if that do. was me, I was you, uh -huh. I would think you know, for if sure I, even I hear, if, up. if I even hear we have to do another take, I always think it's because I fucked it's up. Interesting. Not because there's a boom right, shadow. Right, right, right. When it's usually because there's a boom shadow, you know. But we all, we are all I'm so deeply. I'm being followed deeply, by a boom shadow. We're all boom deeply shadow. insecure. But, but by the way, I am not insecure with Curb. That's the only place I'm completely comfortable besides a stand-up stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any other project, other people directing, I'm not involved with the storytelling or producing, right. and I'm not one of the cast. Uh, it's all because you're me. coming in. You're a guest. So yeah. when, Again, did you, you started out. Can I? Well, I was just going to say, how uh, was what was it like to work with Julia in that scene? Well, first of all, we were outside the door, so she has to come in first. So we're waiting outside and we're like, you know, kibitzing a little bit. And then she goes in and then I come in and then I knock and come in later. And she's, she's like, you missed the appointment. And and so and then I go all lawyerly. Well, this is just a disagreement. You saw that as a meeting. I saw that as a horrible moment in my life, all written out of my brain, all of it, right. every line. So it's so satisfying. And, you know, it's just cracking. You know, she's to me, she's. Lucille Ball level comedic yeah. no, actress. No, she can be sane in the same breath. I, I, a, I, I know that sounds like a lot, but I, I really feel... She can be sane in the same but breath. But no, she is that. They're she's, both sane. She's a terrific but, but comedic she's actress. She's terrific. Yeah. I, I, I mean, her work did, on Seinfeld. Well, how about her work on Veep? When he did the scene with her, it was just post-Seinfeld. Right. Yeah, and I just thought she was the glue that held that show together. Uh -huh. I thought, Oh, no, she no, no. Was, she was the glue on Seinfeld. Unequivocally. Thank you. Thank you. Unequivocally. And just, I'm a knight. You know, so, I, so in a way, your character, you, you were emulating your characters. I, did. I mean, yeah. but I don't, I don't really have that with actresses and actors. Yeah. Except that I don't, I don't go goo but no, you know, oh, I, that's way, not my thing. Maybe for like, oh, like Dr. J or something, you know, <laughs> you like know somebody who I'm going uh, nuts nah. for in that way that we're working with now and worked last season, Tracy Ullman. Oh yeah. yeah, just, yeah. When I'm doing a scene with her, I cannot believe I'm there. Yeah. She is, especially when she's in that character. She's marvelous. I cannot she's just, believe I'm working with Tracy Ullman. And, it's and she's also gifted at that level. Gifted. But she's, uh, gifted. she's really fascinating to watch. Oh my to God. watch the, the, Every the take, machinations. And she comes up with stuff where you go, right. how did someone think of that? And it's Larry level stuff. You yeah, know? yeah. You know, it's just, but uh, once they did the show, I don't know if you know this, when the Emmy nominations went out, like that show was up for consideration. The Wire, they were really pushing it. Didn't get nominated. It's fine. Doesn't matter. But I kept getting compliments from people, especially as the show 
became this thing. And which it was not really in the first right, season. Right, 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 right. We didn't know, but it- Hold uh, on. It was under the radar in the first you, season. I told you, I've talked about this before. HBO referred to us- What? As oh. their little experimental show. Yeah. You're kidding. Swear we to God. Even after the first season? And I've mentioned this before, we're the longest running show in the history of HBO. Right, yeah. right. So that, that the, your little experimental show, it, right. it, 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 the but experiment was we, we were was very successful. much under the radar it, that first for, few seasons. For, Two or three, right? So no, one, until one. till we followed the Sopranos, right? Uh, Season three, and then three. it became ninety minutes of delightfulness oh, for people. Interesting. But but this is uh, the honest truth. It's the my favorite wait, wait, thing wait, wait, I've wait, ever wait. done. Again, in shit. honest and truth. All right, okay. Jeff, Same let thing. him talk. Okay. okay, okay. Say it again, Wayne. I apologize. This is, I, in my opinion, it's my favorite thing. I've ever done in show business. Wow. And you can look at my my IMDb. I'm almost at 100. I'm right. hovering around 92. I look every day. I'm at 6,000. <laughs> <laughs> I've never looked. I, I, look, I, I look every day. So uh, of all the things, I played Larry Sanders' brother. I was Stan Sanders. I've been in his stepbrothers. I've been in a lot of like yeah. little things. And but, this was your favorite. You know, I think well, and I people think, ask me all the time, and I always say it. I, I, always I think say one it. of the reasons why, yeah, and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. well, a couple of reasons. First of all, you're working with Larry, you, mm -hmm. you're working with, with that brain, but also the fact that you get to have so much creative input by writing your own scenes, by writing your well, own you're not lines. Writing ding, them, ding, you're ding, improvising, you're whatever, ding. but you're writing it. it, it yeah. you, ding, it, ding, ding. It's as if it's written. So, so you, you, you are so a part of the creative process and the creation of this show in a way that you're not when you have a script. And also, I like what I see. And a lot of times I see myself act. I'm like, oh, I can see. The, I always hate myself. Do you know except, that? The, except for Curb. Yeah. I cannot stand to watch. What do you like, see? Like, I'm in Babylon right now. Yeah, I've seen it. Big movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I get mixed. People love it or hate it. They right, come right. up to me. I know I will hate my performance, and I might hate the movie, and I don't want to hate the movie because I love the filmmaker I sound like so I much. hate my performance. What about you, Susie? The thing I can't watch is I can't watch when I'm myself. Like, if I'm on a talk show oh. or something, or if I'm doing stand-up, that I cannot bear. I, I love to watch Curb because it's so no, funny. Take away Curb. I'm saying when you oh, see Oh, when yourself, I see myself, I like, can't stand it. Nauseating. Why? What do you see? What uh, do you I just, I, 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 I. By the way, can you even explain it? I can't. Well, <laughs> I, it, it never feels, no. it feels false. It feels, it feels. Hyper, ding, ding. Hold it on. feels false. Hypercritical. I'm You're not. Looking, I, no, no, it's not about, that's like, not what I'm what saying. about hypercritical? No, it's not about that. It's about what you're seeing. You're seeing yourself. You're not inhabiting the character in You're the same way in that opinion. you are in Curb. In Curb, you know, I put on those outfits and I become her. I don't yeah. even think about it. Right. I just become her. Whereas other things, I, I see acting. I see, I agree. Uh, you, you ding, know, ding. Do you ding, know ding. When I'm and I some... don't see that in Curb <clears throat> ever. So, so, I, so you have me. the exact same thing. Yeah. That so, I, that's but, why by I the way, always say. I've actually thrown up. I've had to leave the theater and go throw up in my performance. Not making up. That's one hundred percent. Wayne, you're going to come back and talk about your your oh, next your season seven. Oh wow! I episode. love it. I love it. Uh, you're a joy. Uh, you're thank a you. And you were amazing as Dean Weinstock. Fella. And you got you got every nuance of that character so perfectly. Don't you yeah. agree, Jeff? I mean, I, just I do. And, every I and I'm glad it. that Lotus Weinstock is connected to it in a way as well. It makes me very happy. Yeah, I love stuff like that. Thank you. You're welcome. So Larry wakes Susie up. I hope up. That, that was a good interruption story. Yeah. I'm really hopeful. Um, so it begins between Larry and Susie is my yeah. point. Then Larry and Jeff go to a restaurant. Susie's mad. Dean is shrewd. Jeff wants to fire Dean. LD begs Jeff to keep Dean. You're a prick. Why did I write that? Oh, because he says Dean is a prick. You're a prick. Mm -hmm. as, as, as though All it's pricks. a good thing. As a manager, you're By a prick. By the way, here's an unusual point that you're not bringing up. Larry says the cutoff time is 1030 and you, you answer and tell him we have kids, that there's kids. He repeats kids, it. I know. Kids. I did notice that yeah. with an S. Yeah, kids. But that everything changed. I know. I you know. know, because Sammy was a boy. Right. Oh, yeah. Originally, Sammy was a boy. <laughs> right. That's right. Okay. And then, you know, Larry begs Jeff to keep Dean because he needs Dean. Otherwise, his marriage is going to fall apart. And then you tell Larry that the kid wants to stay with us. Which is insane. But believable. Which is insane. Believable for my character. Yes. Yes, because yeah. you're just sweet and lovable. Then next scene, Julia and Larry show up at Dean and Phyllis's. 
and Phyllis is hysterical crying. Hysterical. This is so funny. I mean, like her mascara is all. Mascara is running down. She looked down. great. I mean, yeah. it was a great makeup job and a great performance. And it turns out her cat died. Yes. Which, like Larry, could care fucking less about right. her cat. And you know, when you lose a cat or a dog, or it's really overwhelmingly sad. It really. It, it when is. I, I've if lost I, whenever a dog, I lose, yeah. not if. Whenever I lose Sage. Uh, uh, no, it's it's real. It's gonna. It's gonna Kick me in but the Larry room. could care less. I mean, yeah. he was so no, disinterested. No, but, yeah, but Larry's such a, in real life, Larry's a dog person. He is. He loves his dogs. But uh, okay. Dean is not there because Dean is with Jeff. Yeah. And then a brutal discussion about the cat dying. The details yeah. of, you know, I had a neighbor who every time she would come to our house would tell us the history of every dog's death that she ever had. Oh, my God. And then, oh, Fido died. Uh-huh. And then she would come over a few months later and I would hear again the details of every dog's death that she ever had. That she is, relived it every time. Well, she needed to let it out. She did. And, but and you were nice to let her. I let her You leave. never asked her to leave. And then Phyllis brings out the camcorder. And you know no good could come. You know this right. is going to be a fucking nightmare. Right. The camcorder. Um, and Phyllis, tell me about Jerry Seinfeld. Larry says he's a eunuch. He has I mean, no, no balls. testicles. No yeah. testicles. You know, another thing that struck me about this is that in this episode, in an earlier episode, a couple of, there was a lot of Seinfeld mentioning, which kind of went by the wayside in later right. seasons. Right. It was more present it in this season. It felt natural. We weren't trying to no, force it. No, I know, it. but it, it was more present. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it was just a timing thing because it was right after. And by the way, what was also interesting in this episode where something happened for the very first time, because Larry most of the time is a victim of circumstance. Right. And then he makes it worse. Well, here, Julia's doing him a favor, and I'm watching her in this scene, and she's Larry. Yeah, yeah. She's Larry. She's being put on upon. She does not want to be Yeah, she does not want to be there. So Larry calls Jeff. Dean is still there. Julia wants to buy the bracelet. Again, so the bracelet comes back well, by the way, two episodes ago. But you're not only two episodes. We, we, we mentioned it last episode, the episode before this. Right. And then it gets to here, and it's a real callback. Like I, I don't think we've ever done... A, an individual storyline that has nothing to do with the season. Forget two episodes, three episodes. Yeah, I don't think so either. But we'll see. There might have been a callback, you know, when I'm bald that he mentioned something. I'm just trying to think of the, the times where I shaved, my head was shaved. I don't know. But this was really unusual yeah. to me. But again... This is season one. Right. It's finding itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Julie wants to buy the bracelet. It's the same bracelet he wanted to buy for Cheryl. And, you know, Larry realizes that he's got to figure out how to get this bracelet. And Julia's going to have to come back over. And Larry doesn't want to impose. But then Larry realizes he gets home and he realizes he lost his notebook. And he calls Julia. It's 10 to 10. It's before the cutoff time. Because now he realizes Susie says the cutoff time is 10. Well, Julia's cutoff time is, of course, 9.30. Right. And then Larry shows up at Julia and Brad's house, and it's late, uh, and he's looking for his notebook, and they do not want him there at all. He's and that's going, really her husband. Brad, yeah, Brad Hall. Brad Hall's really her and husband. And by the way, they that's met at Northwestern, really... and then they were in the um, Practical Theater Company, which was next to Second City. Uh -huh. Same kind of work. And then she went on initially to an SNL, and he became a writer. He was on SNL, too, They're I think. They're still married. And their son played basketball at Northwestern University. These are fun facts for yes. young and old. Okay, go ahead. And Larry goes through Brad's desk. Larry's being really intrusive and ridiculous. And you could see they're getting angrier and angrier. But by the way, it's at that, this moment when I'm watching the episode and watching how Larry handles it and what he goes through and to asking the kid, like the whole thing. And all I'm thinking is, how does Larry David do this? How does he come up with this? And he's so fucking brilliant that it just blows my mind. Even the little scenes just are like, wow. And it's connected. And it's the same thing with Nat Hyken, who I mentioned. It's these dominoes where you go, where, how? That's why Larry, Larry David... And then also, what a good actor he is. No, he's excellent. And, and he's, he's always getting better, which he, he got mad at me once for telling him that he got... Like maybe season two, I go, you're getting so much better. Whoa, it wasn't good before. He was... I mean, I'm not even making... He was really upset with me. But the, the thing about working with Larry David and so closely is such an honor for me. That's like, you know... Me working with Michael Jordan, except uh, I'm not Scottie Pippen. I'm uh, Dennis Rodman. I get the rebounds. I pass it off. Scottie Pippen is you. Scottie Pippen is JB. I never yeah. thought of myself as Scottie Pippen. Cheryl's the coach. 
Yeah. Okay, I just did a whole Bulls thing, but that is really true. I, I, I'm working with one of the greatest of all time, certainly the greatest showrunner of modern times. I would agree with that. You know, we all, we T- all comedy. Are. I'm saying we both know? are. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing. No, it's amazing. Okay. Um, all right. And so, I'm lucky so, to work with you. So, and I'm lucky to work with you. And and Brad and and Julia kick him out. Yep. And then Larry comes to our house in the middle of my tirade. I, I want to go back again, as I usually do, because this is big, and that you, I want you to talk about it. But you know what I also thought after that scene with Brad and Julia? and all that? I thought, God bless Julia for doing our show. The same way that she did the favor for Larry, Larry with Poutine. The Wire. With The Wire. It's pretty much a similar thing of Larry going, will you please come on the show? I wrote this for you. And he wrote sign for what's she going to say? No. Although she loved Larry. Well, you can see. You know, but, but, I, but season also, one, man. I know season one, but it's not Diane Keaton. It's a different relationship because Larry created an iconic character for her, her yes. that she did for, what was it, nine seasons or I whatever. Know. And I'm sure she was extremely grateful for that. But she did our show for that. before we even had the Seinfeld thing. Right. She was the one who did the show, I think, three times before the Seinfeld episode of the other guest appearances. So she's a doll, by the way. Yes, she is. And extremely talented uh uh, comedic actress, yeah. extremely talented, crazy talented. So, actually, with Veep, actually crossed over, crossed, crossed over into brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I was in awe of watching yeah. her on that. Okay, so now Larry walks in, and the fresh air fun kid that you brought into our house robs us blind. Yep, and I am going crazy on you. And this is the first time you see the Susie Jeff Larry relationship and Susie being the this is the reason why he hired me was this scene yes. this was the scene he had in mind yes. when he hired me and I have a question here from uh, Anna our producer where did the personality of Susie come from was it decided on before or did it come out when the scene was improvised I will tell you <laughs> the only direction I got from Larry or Larry Charles who was directing the episode was Larry David said to me I want you to rip Jeff a new asshole that was the only direction he gave to me. And I thought, well, you know, I could do that. I've been in relationships before. And so I, the rest was it. That's the only direction I've ever gotten on this character. I just instinctively, and you understand this, I looked at the house and the decor, and it was all this very modern and black leather. And if you, if you recall that house, and I just decided who the character was. I just decided how she dressed. I decided who she was. I just, you know, I saw what you were doing and who would be married to you and this character. And that was it. There was no more thought that went into it. So I'm screaming at you and yelling at you and cursing and fuck you and blah, blah, blah. And then Larry keeps, Larry David keeps pulling me over and says, go do it more, do it more. And I thought I was doing a lot. And again, another take screaming, yelling, fuck you, fuck you. And then he pulls me aside and he says, I want you to make fun of Jeff's fat. And I said, La, I, I don't want like to do that. That's not my style of comedy to make fun of somebody's looks. Or I hate that in stand up. Right. You know, when you go after somebody in the audience for what they oh, look it's like, horrible. It's, it's horrible. So I, it's not my style. And some people do do that, you know. Right. Um, and I was like, I don't. And he was like, just, just do it. Just do it. He knows you're just acting. I was like, it's not nice. Jeff's my friend. You weren't even thinking. You know why? Because you're a fat fucking asshole. That's what you are. This is not my problem. This is your problem. So that's the first time I called you a fat fuck. And then it was like the genie was let out of the (laughs) The bottle. Yes, the genie was let out of the bottle. (laughs) And you did it numerous times in that scene. And do you know how many times people ask me how uh, you don't do it anymore uh, on the show? And people always said, you know, does it bother you when she calls you a fat fuck? I go, two things. I'm probably thinking about lunch. I'm probably thinking about a <laughs> phone call. Service. To yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about taking a nap. I am definitely not hurt by it because I know it's a pretend. And also, I would say all the time, well, if it bothers me, she call me a fat fuck. All I got to do is lose weight. Well, but also more importantly, the character is calling the character a fat fuck. It's not me, Susie Espin, calling Jeff Garland a fat fuck. And I completely, I was, I've never been offended or And that was Larry's point. Larry's point was, he knows it's not you. He knows it's the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I got to be honest, many of those scenes, I was a fat fuck. 
Well, in that, in that season, I especially. Was <laughs> I was a fuck and I was fat. All right. But so, yeah, so that was the first time. And then the character just started to develop in my mind. It was an instinctive, you know, I hate this the, the word, but it was an organic thing of how I just felt like, oh, I know who she is. And I just became her. And uh, you know, just especially the way she dressed and that whole thing, which got more and more as further seasons went on. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were so many moments in that in that scene that that I loved. My grandma's brooch, you know, your, your Bro- baseball cards and yeah. the Mickey Mantle and yeah. all of that stuff was just so much My fun. My favorite thing was at the end. You were talking about your grandma, how she got, and you used the word steerage. Steerage. She came over and steerage. And I go, where did she pull steerage from? What about my grandmother's brooch that she brought over from Russia? Did you take it? I don't know. I'm going to go check that right now. She brought it over from Russia from a pogrom. She was in steerage. If that's gone, I'm going to be hysterical. That was the first time I met Larry Charles. And I remember uh, Larry Charles overhearing. He didn't say this. I overheard him saying, you know, I was wondering why they brought this girl in from New York. Like, why'd they schlep this girl in from New York for this part? He said, but now I get it. <laughs> and that was a moment that was, you well, know. You know your work before Yeah, that. exactly. So and that I've was a nice moment. I already said when Larry David approached me about you being my wife, I couldn't. Well, you I knew me. Quick. Larry no, but I, I was like, me. that's brilliant. Let's go, please. So that was the first establishment and it got more the next yeah, season in the doll. But nonetheless. That was that the was establishing the real... where you and Larry are, are scared of me horrified. Yeah. And that scene, by the way, when you leave the room and, and the Larry's like, I'm getting out of here. No, no, is really funny. Yeah. And like a please, please, you yeah. know. Whereas now he wouldn't leave, you would throw him out. Correct. I know, but, but now established. he deals with all your bullshit and he throws it back at you because you think he's got a lot of bullshit, you've got a lot of bullshit, and then it'll build to where you look to me for help, I don't give you help, and you throw Larry out of the house. That's the rhythm of now. One of my favorite things. Yes, yeah, it's, it's always the funny. House. Okay, oh. and then he goes home, and Cheryl found the... First of all, here's what confuses me. The bracelet's supposed to be vintage. There's like a million copies of this fucking bracelet. Well, by the way, he said, <laughs> is this a, he said forgery or, you know... Something, uh, yeah, something. Something like that. Cheryl found the bracelet. And she goes out. Right. She's, she's going to go buy the bracelet, whatever. And then Julia shows up and Larry apologizes. And, you know, he had the pad. It's nine months of ideas. And he, he tries to explain it. And Julia can't find her bracelet, which was the same exact bracelet that she bought from Phyllis that Cheryl wanted that Richard Lewis already bought for his girlfriend, whatever. This bracelet is complicated. Um, and then she sees the, the bracelet that Cheryl bought sitting on the table and assumes that Larry stole her bracelet. Mm-hmm. Which is just like a beautiful By the way, that's moment. That's classic curb. Yeah. The moment that someone sees something, they assume something, and he goes, No, no. And he starts explaining. And you see and Julia's go, face because she's yeah. such a terrific actress. Yeah. You just see her face of disgust. And before she leaves, Dean shows up. Yes. And Julia has no fucking time for him. She's in a huff. You know what? You come on time. And she's in a huff and she berates Dean. And then, you know. Julia leaves in a huff and Larry kicks Dean out. But before he kicks Dean out, Dean found the notebook. Yes. Which is very, very important. And there's a reward in the notebook. What does it say in the the $500. $500. Which was based on the truth. Uh, That Larry really did write that in his notebook. Yes. And then later on, you'd have an email. Well, there was, it was email then. I don't even know if Larry knew what email was then. No, he's very, did we have email then? Sure. The, in in the 2000? Late, yeah. I don't remember. Well, I knew it before then because I was on the cutting edge. I might have had it. I just don't remember. No, l- listen, Susie, I'm on the cutting You're edge. You're on the cutting edge. Young people You're know Mr. It. Technology. Um, but just ending that way of Larry getting the money and giving Huff. What's unusual, though, is the scene ends on Wayne Fetterman. You no, know. the scene and oh, the scene ends on Wayne Fetterman. Wait a minute, the, the, ser- the 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 episode does not end on Wayne Fetterman. What's the, uh, the episode oh, ends with the, the Larry and Cheryl in the sitting in the backyard, the staring at the wire. Yeah, staring anyway, at the wire. By the way, I know Larry used to have a hammock that he'd lay in the backyard, and and, and I go, people think you don't have trouble, so you a lot of anxiety when you lay there. You go, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> people think, yo, you're that rich, you're successful, you don't have anxiety. The, just the Spilkies just come with. Being a Jewish comedian, okay? Yeah. But you know damn well, he's never going to lay in the sun in a chair like that. No. If I asked him now, he would surprise me by saying yes. But you never know with Larry. Comes out of nowhere. Well, he slathers on the sunscreen. Yeah, but that's when we're working and stuff and, and daily. 
his body laying out in the sun. No, it's not for him. Yeah. Yeah. He's not an outdoor kind of guy, yeah. except playing golf, which he oh, does Oh, he also love. hunts. Yeah, he hunts. One little note that I noticed watching the credits, because mm. I like to look at the credits and see. Yeah, I, I watch all, them every time. It's a memory of, of who was. Yeah. And I see that second camera operator of that episode was Patrick Thielander. Patrick Thielander. Who, who is now our cameraman yes. all these years later. Oh, and yeah. I didn't remember Did him just from do back that then. that one season or the first two? I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll yeah. see him next but week. Yeah, Patrick, who I love, yeah. who is from Sweden. Sweden. He is such a wonderful presence on the set. Yes. We happen to have a great crew. We do. And it's it's changed over the years, but there are holdovers and there's some that have, you yeah. know, in the new incarnation when we came back after the long hiatus, not most so of the- great. No, they are. They fed, No, but, not the, we've had, this is our second new incarnation. We had the season where we came back, where some people started and a lot of people weren't there from the past. No, and but then now the last two or three seasons, three seasons, it's been the same steady same, crew. Same crew. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The point I'm trying to make is, and this was the case in the first batch, uh -huh. we did up to season uh, uh, eight and then we took a six year hiatus and then we came back for nine, 10, 11, 12. But the point I'm trying to make is that the crew always wants to come back to Curb, right. that we have a lot of repeat. And a lot of times they leave other shows to come back to Curb. We've been lucky with that. And we were really lucky the first seven, eight yeah, seasons. Yeah, a before, lot of continuity. Because it was really, it was, you know, they always say like a family. But by the way, Patrick, the Cameron, who we were just talking about, fun fact, which we've used in the show. Uh, what do you think Larry David discusses with him every day? Chess. No, he's from Sweden. Hockey. Oh, hockey. Hey, Larry, I was going to say Igmar Bergman. <laughs> no, the Rangers, <laughs> the Rangers are Larry's great. He loves yes, the Rangers he loves more the Rangers, than any other team. And so Patrick, being from Sweden and grew up playing hockey, Larry always has a million questions yeah. for him. Yeah, uh, just they a little discuss fun hockey. fact. And that's the episode. It is. So um, we'll be back uh, soon. Very soon. This and week, to next continue. week. I don't know when they're running or how. We'll figure it out. I know they'll be available to you. And we'll see you next time. We will. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.